Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today is a book club episode. We have Dr. Jonathan Gibson on. He's going to be talking about his new book that he edited, I Will Build My Church, Selected Writings on Church Polity, Baptism, and the Sabbath on Thomas Witherow. And it's published by Westminster Seminary Press. So we'll jump into that conversation here in a few moments. First, as always, just a few reminders for you guys. If you go to our show notes before or after this episode, you'll see some links there. One is from the Westminster Seminary Press. You can click that, find this book, purchase it for yourself. You can also click the link for the Society of Reformed Podcasters. We are in that group with other like-minded reform podcasts out there. There's also uh, some information to become a bridge builder to support our show and a link to click and find a local reformed church near you. How that works is you click that link, you type in your zip code, and in your given area, you'll see uh, the closest reformed churches to you. So uh, we will jump into this book club episode with Dr. Jonathan Gibson and have Peter further introduce him. How are you? Yeah, we have uh, one of the last professors that we have not yet interviewed from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. So Dr. Jonathan Gibson is Associate Professor of Old Testament at Westminster Philadelphia, so Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Previously served as an Associate Minister at Cambridge Presbyterian Church in England, and he's edited and authored a few books, but we're especially talking to him <clears throat> about his book that he edited on Thomas Witherow, and you guys will learn who this guy is and, and a couple of things else, but thanks for coming on to talk about your work. Well, thanks very much, Peter and Nick, for having me on. Absolutely, Absolutely. yeah, and I'm, I'm sure as Nick will ask the question, people have a lot of questions about this book. Who is this guy, and yeah, so we'll, 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 get, into, we'll get into some of these questions, so yeah, if Nick, if, Nick, if you want to start off. Yeah, I mean, these are some uh, initial easy, low-hanging fruit questions, because I think a lot of people are going to s- hear this or see the title, and and even if they're Reformed, just ask the question, what am I <laughs> yeah. missing here? Who's who's Thomas Witherow? Yeah, where's John Calvin? Where's Martin Luther? Like, where are the yeah. guys we know? <laughs> so, yeah, let's open it that, like, because it's an autobiography and a theological type of book, so... Let's jump into the the meat and potatoes of of who this guy is, Thomas Witherow. Well, he was a good man because he's from Ireland. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We've had some Irish people on the show before too, so it's yes. we, we we know we we have some yeah, some uh some knowledge. Yeah. So Thomas Witherow was an Irish Presbyterian minister in uh, the north of Ireland. He was ordained in the Presbyterian Church of Ireland. Uh, He was born in 1824, died in 1890. Uh, He was born in Ballycastle uh, in the north of Ireland near Londonderry. Uh, He was raised in uh, Ochleish, which is a tiny... I was was wondering how to say that word for the longest time. Yeah, it's pronounced Ochleish. It's a tiny little place. I don't even know if you'd call it a village. It probably is today, but in his day, it was just a few farms huh. uh, at the bottom of the Dungiven Mountains, at uh, the bottom of the Ockleash Mountains near Dungiven. Uh, he went to a, a local Presbyterian church, Banagher Presbyterian Church. Uh, his parents and grandparents were Christian, but sort of nominal, not sure if there was faith there or not. Hmm. Uh, by the end of his life, he thinks his grandfather was uh, a believer. He was educated in Belfast at a a famous school in Belfast called the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, uh, also known as INST. He was educated there from 1839 to 1843. Uh, He wasn't converted until 1843 at the age of 19 years old. So even though he was brought up in the Presbyterian Church, he sort of had a nominal faith, even mixed with a bit of salvation by works. Mm -hmm. But he was converted uh, in a summer at the end of his schooling uh, education. And as a result of that, he was doing some theological studies at INST um, and ended up going to Edinburgh for a five-month sojourn, he called it, the five-month sojourn, where he was taught by Thomas Chalmers, who was Mm -hmm. the leader of 
new college in Edinburgh and uh, an established uh, a significant minister in the Free Church of Scotland. So that had a big impact on him. He came back invigorated for ministry. Uh, he felt called to ministry when he actually got converted in 1843 at 19 years old. Uh, Edinburgh sort of reinforced that for him, came back, was licensed in 1845, ordained that year, and then he was called to be the minister of Mahara Presbyterian Church in County Londonderry, uh, and he was a minister there for 20 years. Uh, it was a small town, 1,500 residents. His church was quite big, 375 families, 1,900 members. Humongous, yeah. Yeah, and the thing that he hated most was visitation. And we I, I love that part of the biography. <laughs> yeah, he, he's expected to visit all the families twice a year. Which is ridiculous. So think about that. That's over 700 pastoral visits. Yeah. Um, he ministered during the Great Famine of 1845 to 49, which also meant there was also the Great Emigration <clears throat> to America. Um, and by the end of his ministry, his numbers actually were just a little below what they were when he went but if you consider that he he uh, ministered through the famine and through the emigration, yeah. he actually was probably quite a successful uh, <laughs> yeah. minister. Uh, he was there 20 years. 1865, he gets called to McGee College, Londonderry. McGee College was a Presbyterian college set up to train people in liberal arts, but also to train future ministers for the Presbyterian Church. And he ministered at McGee College for 25 years from 1865 to 1890 when he died. He died young, 66 years old, uh, of heart failure. Uh, during his time, he served as the moderator of the Presbyterian Church of Ireland, 1878 to 79. Uh, he was a family man, though he married late. He married at 35 years old. So he was a minister for 14 years as a single hmm. man. Started at 20, 21, and then 35, he got married. Married Catherine Milling, had 10 children, three sons, and seven daughters. As two sons, each called Hugh, died in infancy. One died at five years old, and then the second son, Hugh, died at six months. And then James was his only surviving son, who actually followed in his father's footsteps, became a minister in uh, Scotland, then England and also was a bit of a writer. Withrow in Irish Presbyterian circles is quite well known. Uh, he was a prolific writer. He wrote historical works on Protestantism in Ireland, connected to the battles that established Protestantism in Ireland, on um, the history of the Presbyterian Church. His magnum opus was um, published near the end of his life, which was called The Form of the Christian Temple, which was a 400 page defense of Presbyterian government and uh, B.B. Warfield at Princeton. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he had some criticisms of the book. He, he spoke very highly of Withrow, mm -hmm. but he was best known Withrow in his day for the works that are in this book, I Will Build My Church, which are three works, The Apostolic Church, published 1855, Scriptural Baptism, published 1859, and then the Sabbath. Those first two works were bestsellers in their day. They went basically all over the English speaking world, um, into Europe as well, some translated into Italian. Hmm. Uh, but they were popular in the States in the late 1800s. And um, he was well known in his time, but less well known today. But that's hmm. why I wanted to republish him. Yeah. Because when you read these works, one of the things that strikes you is the, the clarity and co cogency yep. of yep. his arguments yeah very polemical as you would know having read him <laughs> yeah. he's a feisty presbyterian yep and yep. Uh, he died to defend presbyterianism and we see that from the title of the book the apostolic church what he's really arguing there is that presbyterianism is the for biblical form of church government that goes all the way back to the apostles yeah Quite a bold claim, but yep. then that, that's the claim of Episcopacy, of Anglicanism. They claim they have the apostolic yeah. model of church government, but Withrow saying the apostolic church, which is it? And that's hmm. what he's doing. He's presenting Presbyterianism as the, uh, as the form of church government that takes us back to the apostolic church. So that's hmm. Thomas Withrow, the man. He died yeah. in 1890, buried in... Londonderry City Seminary. 
where where his wife uh, was buried. Yeah, if uh, yeah, maybe if I can add to that too. So you you ended saying that he's he's kind of less well known now, but then we're, we're you're kind of editing his works and getting him back into what what uh what do you how not how do you fall out of favor? What why don't we know of him better today? Like what's kind of the disconnect today? Because we know some 18th or some 19th century preachers, we just don't know Withero as well. Mm-hmm. And what got you interested in, in Withero and in, in studying him? Yeah, I think we don't know him as well because he was also at the same, he was in he lived in the same era as Thomas Chalmers, mm. as Charles Hodge and these guys. So in a sense, he, he sort of lived in their shadow. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, McGee College was just established in 1865, and he was the first professor of church history and pastoral theology at McGee yeah. College. And so it was early days, whereas Princeton had been established, mm-hmm. you know, years and years before. Yeah. Um, so it didn't really have the reputation. Uh, he wasn't a brilliant preacher. He admitted that himself. Yeah. He was just your ordinary Presbyterian minister. It was really his writings that put him on the map of Presbyterianism. And when uh, when he died, uh, one of the newspapers said, a prince has fallen in Presbyterianism. Hmm. And so hence the title of my biography about him, which is included in the book, uh, A Prince of Irish Presbyterianism, yeah. The yeah. Life and Work of Thomas Withrow. Um, so I think in a sense, as I say, he was at the same era, era as other well-known Presbyterians and so lived yep. in their shadow. And also he was involved in a college that was just sort of uh, hmm. beginning. But he he was well-known uh, by the end of his life, certainly in Irish Presbyterian circles. And yeah. the fact that the Apostolic Church went through numerous editions all over hmm. England, Scotland, Ireland, America, it speaks for itself, I think. And I think in one sense, he's just fallen out of um, the, off the radar in the last um, 130 years. Uh, why did I want to republish him? Well, two friends put me on to him. Yeah. And uh, I thought, oh, let me read this. I, I was already a Presbyterian minister. Uh, I was convinced of it, but I, I'd never sort of sat and read a book cover to cover on Presbyterian government. Yeah. And uh, I, I read it and I thought, wow, there's, there's an unusual clarity to mm-hmm. what he's saying here. And so that, that's what drew me in. Mm, okay. And from there, I was led to his book on scriptural baptism, which was at the back of the book I got on Apostolic Church. And I thought, oh, let me put these together. And then I learned, read about him through various sources and learned he'd written a whole bunch of stuff on Presbyterian polity. And I thought, oh, he's got one on the Sabbath. Let me put polity, baptism, and Sabbath together, which are sort of the distinctives of Presbyterianism. Yeah. 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 Um, You mentioned that those three are the distinctives of Presbyterianism, polity, baptism, Sabbath. Uh, Maybe in a concise, as concise as you want, because this is your episode. What is his slash the Reformed Presbyterian view on polity, baptism, and Sabbath? Um, well, on polity, um, he, well, let me give an overview of the apostolic sure. church. Yeah. Uh, that might start to answer that question, yeah. and Nick. Um, he writes in the context of the dominance of episcopacy, of prelacy, of Anglicanism in Ireland. Uh, this is before the partition of Ireland, which when Northern Ireland was created in 1921. So he's um, he's writing when Anglicanism is dominant in mm-hmm. Ireland. And also what was happening was that within Presbyterianism, independency yeah. was becoming more popular. And so there'd been a guy called Alexander Carson, prominent Presbyterian minister in Tobermore, Presbyteria, Presbyterian church, who'd left that church and started a Baptist church in the same town. And he was very influential, Alexander Carson. And so there was this sort of leaning towards independency, even from Presbyterians. So he wrote in that context to sort of counter the dominance of Episcopacy and answer the questions of independency. Mm. Um, what he did was um, he, uh, he basically says, let's go to the Bible and uh, let's find out the principles of church government. But before he does that, actually, he makes an interesting point. He says that a lot of people are uninterested in this um, topic of church polity 
And he says, it's because they think that it, since the matter is not essential to salvation, it's just not important. Yeah. yeah. And this is his first chapter called Statement of the Question is just a, a chapter that should be read by every Christian to convince you that whilst a doctrine might not be essential to salvation, doesn't mean it's unimportant. Mm -hmm. And so it's a brilliant uh, apologetic for why every Christian should be interested in church polity. Um, and uh, he has a great illustration. He says, in shipbuilding, the screws and bolts that gird the ship together are insignificant as compared with the beams of oak and masts of pine, but they contribute their full share to the safety of the vessel and the security of the passenger. So in the Christian system, every fact, great or small, that God has been pleased to insert into the Bible is by its very position invested with importance, answers its end, and though perhaps justly considered as non-essential to salvation, does not deserve to be accounted mm. as worthless. Mm. So it, he starts with this apologetic, and then he says, right, let's now go to the Bible and see what the principles are of church government. And he, he finds six principles of church government. Perhaps we yeah. can go into this a bit later. But he then says, right, if that's what the biblical view yep. of church government is, let's now assess episcopacy, which he calls prelacy, mm -hmm. uh, independency, and Presbyterianism. And he finds that episcopacy, sorry for any Anglican listeners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you might want to close is, your ears on this one. Yeah, yeah, close your ears. Just hit mute at this point. <laughs> yeah. Turn your turn your volume down. But uh, Episcopy fails on every single biblical principle of church polity. Independency fails on three of the six, and surprise, surprise, Presbyterianism <laughs> meets the six categories. Yeah, uh, six principles. Sorry. Um, so that's the general argument for apostolic uh, church, and his his argument basically is that. Presbyterianism, which polity, which is plur plurality of elders in a local church voted on by the people that is connected uh, governmentally to other churches that have uh, a plurality of elders, that there is such a thing as ordination, laying on of hands that can only occur by the presbytery, not by an individual church yeah. elder board or session, and that there's a principle of appeal if there's a problem in one church it can be appealed to all the churches and that jesus christ is only the head of the church no one else and so those are his basic principles of presbyterian polity yeah and maybe, uh, maybe i'll leave the baptism one till maybe when we get on to yeah. the baptism one nick yeah. if i can yeah dig into that maybe a little bit further too with because with witherow there's a lot of it too kind of his autobiography he's looking back growing up in the Presbyterian church is like, why didn't I hear more about polity? Why didn't I hear more about church governance? <clears throat> so he was, I remember reading some of it. He's, he's writing this to, to other churches, other people, other members saying, these are things we need in Sabbath schools. These are things we need to be learning. Um, so kind of how did his background not knowing this stuff and growing? So, I mean, he has effectively, we were obviously he's much smarter and writing a lot more than I am. Um, but I almost have the same exact story. My first 19 years, grew up in a Presbyterian church, didn't know anything about it, uh, mm. and then was saved at 19. Um, so mm. relatively, relatively similar, but I had no idea what Presbyterian was. I just assumed like everybody did the same thing that I did. Mm -hmm. um, so how did, how did his background kind of influence the way he wrote as well? And assuming people are, are going to want to hear this stuff. Yeah, he ends his book on the apostolic church saying that the problem has been, we've been dumb in the pulpit on this. The pulpit has been silent on this. And this is why increasingly in, in his day, people were leaning towards independency because the ministers haven't preached it. Interestingly, the very last thing Withrow wrote was a Sunday school class manuscript on church polity. Mm -hmm. I love that, that here's a man who's committed to the local church. And the yep. last thing he wrote before he died was like a, a lesson that could be taught to teenagers yep. in, in Sunday school on church polity. What formed his his interest in it? Actually, a, a happenstance in his life. He's in Belfast. He's 14, 12, 13, 14 years old. He's walking past May Street Presbyterian Church mm -hmm. on his way home from school one day. And he sees this group of Presbyterian ministers standing in the porch. It's quite an historic church uh, building in Belfast right near his school. 
and uh, there's a big porch set of steps up to it and he sees this group of men and he's intrigued so he go he follows them into the church building and he goes upstairs into the balcony <laughs> and he says i looked down on what i later realized was the synod of ulster <laughs> it was a presbytery meeting mm -hmm. and he said he was fascinated by it and he would basically go to it all the time it was always held in may street presbyterian church and so he would go to this uh meeting this synod of ulster as it was called before it became the presbyterian church of ireland and uh, that's what fascinated him how they handled debate how they ran the meetings and so he sort of had this happenstance in his life to just sort of pass by a church and get drawn into a presbytery meeting and from there came his interest in presbyterian polity uh, so that that's really what drew him in yeah and yes he he realized he'd never been taught any of this stuff in church and so he decided to make it uh, uh um, accessible and available to people and so his his book, The Apostolic Church, it's it's not overly technical. I mean, no. you, you guys can say what you think of it. I, I don't think it's overly technical. It will stretch you. It makes yeah. you think. But it's it's very sort of popular level. Mm -hmm. It's very polemical, which sort of keeps you interested, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, the feistiness it, is, is yeah. very present the entire way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, that, that's really what led him to, to write the book. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Kind of shows his heart, and it's <clears throat> the the audience that he's writing. He's not writing to convince Presbyterians uh, an academic article to other Presbyterian ministers or professors. He's writing it to send to other churches, like, "Hey, maybe this is something you should use for your lay members if you want to use it for a Sunday school or whatever it is." <clears throat> so I think it's a it's a helpful kind of background knowing what this book was meant for um, mm -hmm. when he's writing at that time. Uh, where it's it's meant for people in the pew. It's meant for them to read it, to, for them to interact with it. And say, okay, oh, I I see why our church does what they do. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are wondering, why does my church do this? Like, it's, is there this, like tradition? Is it scriptural? Uh, and it's refreshing to see a Presbyterian minister writing something for lay people where they know um, the background, why we do what we do, where does it come from scripture, what are the principles, all that stuff. It's It's really helpful to hear some of this stuff. Um, for them as well yeah and that that's sort of my hope for the book um and republishing with those writings I, I hope obviously presbyterian ministers read it get a hold yeah. of it get reconvinced and grow in their confidence in their particular uh, position on polity and baptism sabbath but i really hope they then say to their churches here you all yeah. should read this that and it's actually accessible enough mm -hmm. to you that you can read it and so that members in the church sitting in the pew are the ones who are reading it and convinced by it. Yeah, which is, yeah, well, I like I like the title, I Will Build My Church. It's a very, it's okay, I, I see what this book is talking about versus a primer on polity, baptism, and Sabbath, which may not be as interesting on the front end to read than I Will Build My yeah, Church. Because I, I say this in my introduction, um, you know, church polity, baptism, Sabbath, they're not essential to salvation. I sort of repeat what Withrow says, yeah. but they are essential to the health of the mm. church. Yeah. And we're all members of Christ's church if we're Christians, and we're all members of a local church, or at least we ought to be. And if we belong to a local church, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of government of that church am I willing to sit under? Um, if we have children, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of administration of the sacrament of baptism am I happy with? Uh, am I okay with sprinkling put on my kid when he's a baby? Or do I want my kid to profess faith and then be dunked in, in a baptismal tank? We have to ask ourselves, what are yeah. we happy with? And then in terms of our weekly routine, we got to ask ourselves, how am I going to spend the Christian Sabbath, the, the Lord's Day? Am I yeah. going to treat it like every other day or am I going to treat it differently? Yeah. And so these questions are unavoidable. They're inescapable. Polity, baptism, Sabbath. If you're a member of a church, you're going to have to decide what you yeah. think on each of these three topics. Yeah. Yeah, that's I like how you put that, because, you know, as a as believers, the church is our home and needs a strong foundation so that that um, response to somebody that might be reading Witherow and thinking, okay, this guy 
it's talking a lot about this stuff, but it's not Salvitic. So why does it matter? So this is a good explanation and answer that you had to that. And my, um, so you kind of answered a question I already had down. Um, and then the other reaction, it says in the, even in the beginning of this book, some people might read this and think that Witherow comes across legalistic. So how would we respond to that and say, you know, to, to respond to that reaction that people might think he's legalistic? Uh, do you mean in particular to the Sabbath or just generally with poly baptism? Probably generally, just to kind of make it easier to answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you, his opening chapter in the Apostolic Church, this uh, uh, the statement uh, of the question, uh, these doctrines are not um, essential to salvation, but they are important. And so he's really pushing us to say, well, what do you believe on this and well, what do you hold to? I can see some people thinking it's it's legalistic, but I think that um, it's really a straw man argument because at the end of the day, if we're Christians, we we have to we have to obey the Lord through His Word on a whole variety of issues, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, whatever it is, something personal in our lives, how we handle alcohol. Uh, you know, we are to enjoy alcohol, but we're not to get drunk somebody says well that's legalistic well no no it's not it's just <laughs> obeying the good law the lord has given us to enjoy the wine but not abuse the wine and so it's the same with polity uh, baptism what we do with our children and uh, how we spend the the first day of the week uh, you can view it as legalism if you want i i view it as a way of life as a way of life in church under a church government as a way with my children how i want them to be brought into the church the entrance into the church through baptism mm -hmm. and um, how i want to spend the first day of the week so the law for israel at sinai was primarily given not to put them back under slavery because he just brought them out of slavery mm -hmm. the law primarily was given as a way of life mm -hmm. i am the lord your god who brought you out of the house of slavery out of egypt now here's how you should live as my adopted son and uh, I, I think that's the way I like to look on these things. It's, it's a way of life in the in the Church of Christ. Yeah, and he he kind of gets further further into a little bit of this stuff when when he talks about baptism, and especially I think the Sabbath is where a lot of people may have some differences with Presbyterian polity and, and how we view church and how we view the Lord's day. Um, but even with with baptism, he he goes. And we, we were talking kind of pre-recording on some other stuff that's been written on baptism where it's either <clears throat> easy to read, but not a very good argument or a very good argument and not very easy to read. Um, mm -hmm. But he kind of threads a needle really well on an easy to read, very concise, very kind of non-technical language steeped in scripture, but also like some practical stuff on mm -hmm. dipping versus dunking. Uh, and mm -hmm. then a fun little story at the end um, on baptism. So if you, if you want to talk about like what, What's like, what's kind of his unique approach? Maybe not unique. What's, what is the contribution that Witherow brings to the debate on baptism? That's, that's kind of unique to, to what he brings to it. Yeah. So let me give again, a wee bit of historical context, because this helps set yeah. his argument in its, you know, in its context. He, um, he writes it in, it, it, scriptural baptism is published as a book uh, in 1864 and i think even before that but it first came out as two tracks uh hmm. first the mode of baptism and secondly the subjects of baptism and he wrote the two tracks very quickly on the back of what was known as the ulster revival hmm. there was a revival oh, yeah, yeah. in the province of ulster in the north of ireland in 1859 and there was a hundred thousand people converted in a year <laughs> which was big you know oh, his, his, church, his church grew by a couple of hundred in that year and uh or no sorry not not his, his church grew by about 40 members uh, yeah. but that it's, was it's not a big area so 100 000 people being converted is, is quite a quite a yeah big. yeah so it's known as the ulster revival but what was happening was these converts were then being proselytized by the baptists and the methodists being told now you need to be dipped you need to be dunked full immersion and if you don't do full immersion you're not a christian or mm. you, you don't have the full blessing of the spirit yeah and so it, it was really a, a pastoral concern for yeah. withrow that he needed to counter these arguments that he thought these people and a lot of these people had been baptized as children babies mm. 
in the church and then they were converted and so his concern was this thing's going to just go all crazy into credo baptism <laughs> and so he he wrote to defend the mode sprinkling not mm -hmm. dipping and then the subject he wrote to defend that children should rightly receive the the sacrament of baptism so that that was his general argument yeah. the mode of baptism and the subjects of baptism and that was the historical context um there, yes he threads the needle well as you say peter um he starts in the mode of baptism section with the difficulties connected with dipping <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah. th this this is i i love this bit and this totally is where, like comical yeah yeah this is where baptists now need to hit mute or turn, <laughs> turn yeah around. he's he's uh he's nice but he's feisty Oh, he's uh, the the baptism book is probably I think where he gets the most feisty at yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. But here here's his four problems with full immersion with dipping. Uh, Acts two forty one three thousand people were converted on the day of Pentecost and baptized that day in Jerusalem. And he says, well, the difficulty with this is is where were they fully immersed? Mm. Because there is no natural water source. In Jerusalem, there's no river that passes mm. through the city. There's no lake nearby, and so he says it's virtually impossible to fully immerse three thousand people in Jerusalem in a single day. You could sprinkle them because there are mm -hmm. there's the Pool of Siloam, or mm -hmm. but you, the Pool of Siloam. I've been to the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam could fit about 20, 30 people in it max. You yeah. know. So, uh, his second one is the numbers that came to John the Baptist out in the wilderness he said john the baptist would have spent half his life in the water <laughs> yeah um, yeah which you don't want to do you're the yeah. <laughs> um, dipping in the presence of a multitude implies an exposure of the person which many especially modest and delicate females shrink and often live undipped for years rather than encounter uh, and then immersion is a mode of baptism ill suited to a universal religion and I think that's an important point. What do you do in the Arctic, uh, hmm. in the Antarctic, uh, with the Eskimos? Do you seriously go and dip them in some water? Uh, what do you do in the Sahara, where there is no water and someone gets converted? He has this lovely quote uh, as he sort of summarizes the problems with uh, the dipping argument. He says, in a river, a fountain, a city of prosecutors, in a desert, in a prison, or in a private house, it is possible to baptize by putting water upon the person. Mm -hmm. We never read of the apostles going forth in quest of water. With them, the means for performing baptism is always at hand. And mm -hmm. I find that such a powerful yeah. argument to expose the problems with dipping and also actually to make the case for sprinkling. The mode of baptism is always at hand whether you're in a desert whether you're in a prison uh whether um you're in a private house you can baptize anyone you know mm -hmm. by that mode mm -hmm. um yeah so th those are the bits that i find initially uh, very helpful and then he goes on to the scriptural mode of baptism he deals with the baptizo word group and he explains how dipping cannot be the meaning of baptizo so the greek septuagint translation of the old testament uses baptizo for talking about the priests dipping blood on the horns of the altar yeah, yeah. right mm. so the the priest didn't pick up the bronze <laughs> altar in, blood. in yeah. the courtyard and go immerse it in a huge river of blood and then bring it back out and yeah you know it's that that but yet that's what the septuagint uses that uses baptizo so baptizo cannot be narrowly exclusively only yeah. full immersion it, it can be used for that but it actually can be used for sprinkling as well so he makes those kinds of arguments on the mode of baptism but again it's all very accessible yeah uh, and that's what i find so helpful in that book the, the second section is on the subjects of baptism mm -hmm. where he raises the uh, anabaptist objections and answers them and then gives again the biblical evidence for infant baptism yeah. you see his methodology in both books actually also with the sabbath he's a bible man he uh -huh. just says let's go back to the bible let's look at the principles established from the biblical text and let's see which 
system of polity or baptism stands up against those principles. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and maybe if you, uh, and we don't have to go into the whole thing, but kind of with, with his, with his feistiness in, in view of the, the, the feisty withero, um, he goes into this little story on um, the, the, uh, this, this area with a park in it and this, um, this gatekeeper. And he uses this as a, as a, as an illustration of like the old Testament promises, the new Testament fulfillment, how much greater the new Testament is. And why would we keep those who were in the old Testament who are allowed the, the sacrament, who are allowed membership in the covenant community and keep them away from the covenant community in the new Testament. So maybe if you want to like kind of preview what the story is, it's, it's a lot longer than you think it's going to be, but it's, it's a fun story to read and you get his point really early, but it's, it's a cool visualization of, of his, of his argument on baptism. Yeah, it's a parable he tells. It's called the parable of the city um, park. And uh, he says there's this landowner that, uh, you know, owned the land, developed it into a park that it would be accessible for his citizens. And so this citizen and his family hundreds of years before had access to this city park and that the landlord had given him access to him, to his family and his children. Well, generations go by. And the citizen, who's a descendant of this family, goes to um, uh, get access to the park. But there's a new gatekeeper. And uh, the gatekeeper says, yep. sir, you can go into the park, but not your children. And he says, well, hang on. My children used to be able to go in. And my yep. family before me, they could go in with their children. Why can't I? And uh, he says, but the rules have changed. And he says, yeah, but the landlord told me, first of all, my children were allowed in. Mm -hmm. and he, he plays out this conversation between the citizen and the gatekeeper and he just shows the sort of futility and uh, illogical arguments of why children cannot get into the city park mm -hmm. when they were once allowed into the city park and that there is no reason he can give him why they can't actually get in except some just random arbitrary law that says they're just not allowed in anymore. Mm -hmm. And he keeps saying, but but they used to be allowed in and they used to be able to enjoy everything in the park. But so why aren't they why yeah. aren't they allowed in? And halfway through the parable, you're just saying, <laughs> have mercy on the Baptists, please. <laughs> Stop it, we're through. <laughs> yeah. You're just saying, right, okay, we're through. We get the point. We you like just let the Baptists go home, let them <laughs> repent in their own time, but he just won't let it go. And he just no, he just goes the conversation for it. going. And then it ends with a great line. He says, um, the gatekeeper shrunk into his lodge as a snail into its shell and the <laughs> citizen and his children returned to their home. Now the gatekeeper was an Anabaptist. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> uh, yeah. It's the funny thing is you're uh, not surprised at the end. You're like, well, yeah, that's, yeah. This is exactly who I thought it would be. Yeah, you, you know uh, early on he's a Baptist, but it's just the fact he actually has to underline yeah. it again. At yeah, the end. <laughs> yeah. Twist yeah. the knife at the end. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, like you said, it's it's a but it's also a, it's a fun sort of it shows you <clears throat> in a maybe in a yeah a parabolic way. Yeah. Um, that the promises from the old have not changed coming to new, and in, in fact they've right. expanded. The promises have expanded. Yeah. They haven't changed. They've expanded. And it's a really good visual for some of this stuff. Yeah, it's a it's a brilliant illustration. It's yeah. a great analogy. Pastors who are convinced Presbyterians could use it. Oh in yeah, the, in the pulpit, not as long. Don't don't, read <laughs> but they could just simplify it and shorten it, and the point would drive home, be driven home really oh, yeah. well. You know. Yeah. No, that's yeah, great. So at the end of the day, it's about continuity, isn't it? Yep. This is his big point on the second part of the book, subjects of baptism. He says the constitution of the church through the two dispensations of old covenant, new covenant has not changed. Yeah. Because God does not change. God does not change the way he relates to people. This is what I used to be. I don't know if you know this. I, I used to be a zealous credo Baptist till huh. I was 30. Oh. Yeah, I was brought up in the Christian brethren. Okay. And uh, then sort of reformed Baptist conviction. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, through uh, reading church history, actually, it's just seeing that all the reformers, repeto Baptists, sort of made uh -huh. me right. I need to have more respect for this mm -hmm. position. Um, 
but yeah, I was a, I, I used to keep my Presbyterian friends at university going, give me a verse. Come on, show me, show me the six week old. <laughs> yeah. Got baptized. I, I had all the arguments, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I've now forgotten what I'm telling you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. what, what convinced me, yeah. what a number of things convinced me, but one of the things convinced me was that I couldn't, I got to the point where I couldn't accept I was teaching Bible overview material in a church in Cambridge, a Baptist church, and I just couldn't get my head around. Well, first of all, I kept seeing the continuity yeah. to you and to your children, to you and to your children. It's there throughout the Old Testament, and it's there in the Old Testament prophecies of the new covenant. Yep, yep. Jeremiah 32, 37 and 38, Ezekiel 37, 23 to 25, Isaiah 65, yep. 18, you know, the new covenant promises stated in the Old Testament referred to the children. And, and so I saw this mm -hmm. and I couldn't get away from it. But I couldn't get away. I couldn't understand how God would start. If God related to children like that in the Old Testament, and it was the covenant of grace in shadow form, but it was still the covenant of grace in essence. Mm -hmm. Why does he cut them out of the covenant of grace in the New Testament? In the new covenant, if they were included in this very same covenant in the yeah. old testament, I, I couldn't get my head around that. And I realized it's like God cutting the umbilical cord just at the very point where biblic redemptive historically he's moving from exclusion to inclusion. Huh. So you know, at the point of the new testament, he's about to expand this access of these yep. promises to the world but he mm. decides to cut the children out while he's doing it mm. it, it i realized it cut against the green of yeah. biblical theology yeah and um you move on on the baptist scheme you move from greater to lesser on the presbyterian scheme you move from lesser to greater mm. you know you, you you the children had it better in the old testament than yeah. the children today have it in baptist circles you yeah. know and so <clears throat> that just made no sense to me so and my point is withrow makes this argument that the constitution the nature of the church has never changed between the two testaments and i realize that that's also because god doesn't change yep. uh, my uh the minister that was influential on me in cambridge ian hamilton who I then served with as his associate minister at Cambridge Presbyterian, he, when people would say to him, why are you a Peter Baptist? He says, I've got one answer. God does not change. Hmm. I was, I was, you know, he had other answers, but yeah. just, I've got one answer. God does not change. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's really good. Isn't it? That God does not change in the way he relates to people between the two testaments. Yeah. And if you're a Baptist, you really have to end up with this bizarre scheme where god does actually relate differently to children in the new covenant than he does to the in the old covenant and in the old covenant he related to them better hmm. than it does in the new covenant but the new covenant is supposed to be better than the old covenant you know yeah. so you end up with these problems but with yeah. deals with some of that yeah yeah our our children are not heathens <laughs> so yeah. they they need to be brought into the covenant community. And yeah. um, it, before we jump into Sabbath, I just coming in my head uh, is that some, some churches too that are independent will look at baby dedication as hmm. their, their defense of, but it's not baptism, it's baby <clears throat> dedication. But I mean, just an offhand comment, uh, what do you, what do you kind of take on that? Yeah, my response to people who dedicate their children in Baptist churches is, can you dedicate what's unclean? Huh. Yeah. In the Bible, you view them you as unclean. Only, yeah, how can you dedicate? You could only dedicate what's clean. You could only consecrate what's clean. But according to the Baptist framework, children of believers are unclean. They're yeah. not holy. So why are you dedicating something to God that's unholy? But but I I like look I like that they do it I just wish they'd use some water while they do it <laughs> yeah you're you almost know, there you're, yeah, you're, it's, yeah and it's sort of a, edge yeah um it's uh, it's sort of a way to absolve a bit of subconscious guilt I think in Baptist context that they actually do believe the children are different to pagan children and this is their way of sort of showing that and. So so I, I commend, I wouldn't say I commend it. 
I'm I'm glad they do it. I'm glad yeah. they don't treat them like either uh, uh, like complete and other pagans. But I wish they'd just be more consistent uh-huh. and say the reason we're actually dedicating them is because they are clean, they are holy, and actually now they, as Calvin would say, we owe them the sign of the sacrament <clears throat> precisely because they're holy. Um, yeah. No, that's and maybe yeah. One thing before we can move on, and that like there is a we we've talked about this before in our show. There is a big agreement we have with Baptists, which is you do baptize those who come from outside the faith, those who mm-hmm. don't have oh, believing absolutely. parents. And, and he makes that point in, in like right in the middle of the Baptistic section, <clears throat> where he's like that we we do have we do have continuity with with the Baptist argument, where if you don't come from within the covenant community and you come and you profess faith, then you're baptized, you take the Lord's supper, all that stuff. But he's saying, um, kind of foundationally, what we see in Scripture too is is also the the children are involved in the church as much as the, the adults are, and the children of believing parents, because Paul, Jesus, the Old Testament treats them as part of the same covenant community. Yeah, exactly. That, that was another thing that I realized when I made this move from credo to pedo. Uh, yeah, pedo baptists. Uh, I prefer the term covenant baptists we yeah, don't yeah. Um, exclude converts getting yeah. baptized now the mode would still be sprinkling although i've got no major issue with dipping neither does the westminster confession yeah. it allows for it though yep. sprinkling is preferred but uh what i realized was that the book of acts which was really it's really one of the strong arguments that baptists use is look they're only ever believer baptisms you know they get yep. converted they get baptized after they're converted yeah wither goes through this yeah and then i realized Actually, they're all just a bunch of Abrahams in yep. the book of Acts. They all, the order is repentance, faith, circumcision for Abraham. The order in Acts is repentance, faith, baptism as an yep. adult. The question is, what did Abraham do with his children? The order was different for him than for his children. It was different for his children than for him. The order was circumcision, then raised up to repent and believe. Yep. So the question then becomes is, what's the order in the book of Acts? And of course, I don't claim that there's a text for a baby getting baptized, but there are households. Mm -hmm. which Again, is strange if the day of Pentecost is the inauguration of the new covenant and what's new in the new covenant is the structure of the old covenants being broken, the genealogical principles being broken. Well, then why are these households all getting baptized? All the name baptisms and acts are all household baptisms um and then you've got ephesians 6 2 children uh, yep. obey your parents in the lord it's not children mm-hmm. in the lord obey your parents it's children obey your parents in the lord and then he gives them the promise of the fifth commandment honor your father and mother because if you do it will go well with you and you'll live long in the land so what is paul assuming of every child in Ephesus to give them the covenant promise if they obey their parents. He's assuming they're all covenant members because you can't give that to a pagan. Um, And so I started to see things like that, that um, Acts is all a group of Abrahams. It's the beginning of the church. Uh, of the new testament church i should say yeah it's the beginning of the new testament church and so it's all just a bunch of abrahams getting converted yeah, yeah. it's then what do you do with their children that's the issue yeah so I, I, the, I love yeah with those with those um kind of trek through some of the baptisms and acts and and shows a lot of the stuff that you're you're talking about too yeah and the so circumcision in the old testament points towards baptism in the new testament yeah yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is in Genesis 17, where God says to Abraham, you circumcise yourself, um, your children and foreigners in your house. Yeah. So there are three groups in Genesis 17 or to receive the sign of the eternal covenant of the covenant of grace. Well, you go to the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches. They, they say, what should we do? He says, repent and be baptized. This promise is for you, for your children. And for all those who are far off, there's yeah. the three categories, adults, children, and Gentiles, foreigners. Yep, yep. And so it's continuity, not discontinuity. But if Peter in his sermon is inaugurating the change from the old covenant to the new covenant, which is the children are cut out, why does he mention the children? And why does he speak in the three categories that are there in Genesis mm-hmm. 17? So yeah. 
again, continuity is all over the place. And sort of when you see it, you can't unsee it. Yep. Um, that's what I feel. I, I know a few people who've gone from being Presbyterian to being Baptist. I met one guy recently. I was at a nine marks thing with Mark Dever. A minister came up to me, he says, you know, I used to be a Presbyterian. And then I saw the light and <laughs> went back to be, I went to being a credo Baptist. And I said, I, I don't think you ever saw the light. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were never uh, of us. It, if you see it, you can't unsee it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. But before we jump into Sabbath, um, one one last bapt baptism kind of um, maybe uh, defense that we could have is as there is the argument that uh, a lot of credo Baptists would have is, but Jesus was baptized as an adult. So could you just answer that part before we jump into Sabbath? Uh, sure. He was also circumcised. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yep. Days, right. So yep. there's, there's another argument for infant, uh, infants receiving the sign of the sacrament. Yep. Yep. Um, so that would be the first thing. Second thing is yes, he was baptized, but as he says very clearly to John, uh, it's to fulfill all righteousness. He, he wasn't baptized because he'd repented and believed. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was baptized because he was taking the place of sinners yep. but john's baptism was a baptism of repentance and jesus didn't need to repent but he was doing it as a substitute yep yep um, right so to use him as a sort of paradigm mm -hmm. for why a believer needs to be baptized it sort of totally misses the point of jesus's baptism he he was not setting an example for us he was more being a substitute for us yeah Cool. Thank you. So yeah, let's jump into Sabbath to close it out. Um, on Witherow's explanation, to Sabbath, um, and and what it what it means for you know the individual believer and the church. Yeah. So he um, this is the shortest of the three works yep. in the book, um, but again, sort of typical Witherow, very clear, very mm -hmm. cogent, straight to the point. Um, and then polemical near the end. Again, what's the context, historical context is, he writes this in 1871. It, it came about as lectures that he gave to some ministers and churches in Coleraine in uh, County Antrim in the north of Ireland uh, in 1871. Then he later published it as a single uh, book. Um, and uh, the context was that what was on the horizon for people in Ireland was that there was talk about them opening up shops and entertainment places on the Sabbath on the Lord's Day mm -hmm. and making it, you know, uh, allowable for people to go and do all the things they do every other day of the week. And he saw ahead of time what that would do to society, mm -hmm. how it would change things dramatically. And, you know, people are saying, oh, don't worry, that's what's happening in London. It'll never come over here to Ireland. And he's like, it'll come right through our little towns and villages and everybody will have to be working on a Sunday, yeah. like just like any other day of the week. So that was the context. And so the title, the subtitle of his book, The Sabbath, is not a church holiday, but a divine ordinance mm. under all dispensations. So mm -hmm. he's got a sort of got two pronged argument. The first is it's not a holiday. It's a holy day set aside for worship. And secondly, it is an ordinance that continues into the new covenant. So sort of connected again to the mm -hmm. baptism issue. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is there continuity between old and new? Uh, he deals with the distinction between a moral and a ceremonial law. Yep. Yep. And uh, talks about how, and this is why I like him, because he's sensitive to the change that occurs to the Sabbath with the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that because some some Sabbatarians I listened to, you'd think there was absolutely no change at all. The, the way they treat the Sabbath for me is very mosaic yeah, and not Christological. It comes with a lot of do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, rest. Sorry? Yeah, instead of rest. This is, this is, our, this is our day yeah, of rest, yeah. also the beginning yeah, versus the end. Yes. Um, so that's, he, he deals with the modifications that go with the Sabbath to the Lord's day of the coming of Christ. And then his big point is that there is the perpetuity of the Sabbath It runs between yeah. the old and the new. The change is that the, in the old Testament, the Sabbath is the last day of the week. Yeah. And then the change occurs that it's the first day of the week in uh, mm -hmm. the covenant. 
Um, and then he moves at the end to dealing with efforts to make the day a day of amusement and that nobody would be any richer for the abolition of the Sabbath. Yeah. So yeah. those are his general arguments. Uh, I myself wouldn't be as strict on what recreational things can be allowed on the Lord's Day. I, I'm happy to go and kick ball with my son in the garden and mm -hmm. go and enjoy uh, some outdoor activity with the family. I, he suggests to me that he, he that would probably be a bit uh, <laughs> too much for Withrow. Yep, yep. Uh, so you know, readers will have to work out where where they what they thinks allowed and not allowed. In Northern Ireland, when I was growing up. Um, in some parks, believe it or not, they would wrap the swings around the bar <laughs> on, a sad, on a Saturday night and they'd be locked up in a sense until Monday. They would unwrap oh, them. I mean, yeah. The, huh. For me, that totally misses actually the principle of the Sabbath because right. the Sabbath was inaugurated after they'd been in slavery for 400 years. They hadn't had a day off. So yeah. if you think God was okay with the kids going for a wee swing, you know, one day a week when they'd been slaves for 400 years. Yep, yep. The Sabbath was also included in Leviticus 23 as among the festivals. Yep. Well, the festivals in, involve eating the best food, drinking the best wine, meeting family, friends, partying, playing games together up near the temple. I mean, imagine the, 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 the noise that would have been coming out during those festivals. Well, yeah. the Sabbath was put in in Leviticus 23 with festivals. So in Northern Ireland growing up, um, Sabbath, Lord's Day felt more like a funeral <laughs> than a festival. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 you know, I would just give readers a little bit of caution. Withrow's a man of his time writing at a certain time. And uh, for me, I'd probably give a bit more of a positive uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, emphasis on what you can do on the Sabbath as a way to really enjoy it and make it the best day of the week. Uh, I, Jackie and I have said we, we do not want our children to grow up and say, oh, we couldn't, oh, we dreaded Sundays because it was mm. like so boring. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. we all had to sit around, read a book and stare at the wall, you know, read, read John Owen volume 11 <laughs> and stare at the wall. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We, sounds we sounds like kids. my kind of time. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well actually now that you do have kids sometimes i want to just read volume 11 of owen and stare at the wall <laughs> that, that, that's me um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but um yeah so anyway that that's just a caveat on oh uh withrow was a man of his time but his argument i think is excellent and his argument is that the sabbath uh, is in perpetuity it's it's continued from the old to the new and and this is where if I could engage with probably what modern evangelicals generally yeah. say, even some Anglicans, certainly Sydney Anglicans. The argument is the Sabbath is over. Christ is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He's the Sabbath we've been looking for. So now there's no such thing as the Sabbath of yeah. the Lord's day. Yeah. But the problem with that is that um christ's coming is not the only coming of christ mm -hmm. there's the first advent and the second advent of christ mm -hmm. and there's the now and the not yet and mm -hmm. the book of hebrews chapter four tells us there is yet a sabbath rest for the yep. people of god and so if there is yet a sabbath that we're heading towards that means there must still be a type and sign of that sabbath mm. yeah. if you hold that in christ it all came to its absolute fulfillment and consummation then you're it's sort of strange then you have this thing that we're looking forward to of which there is nothing today which is a type of it mm. yeah there's a sign pointing to it so signs only become obsolete when the reality has fully dawned Hmm. And the reality has reached its consummated form. And it the rest that God promises us has not yet reached its consummated form. We yeah. live between the now and the not yet, the already and the not yet. And so we, I think we should enjoy our Lord's days as a type of the heaven. Uh, yep. <clears throat> um, and that means they should be 
a joyful occasion, get the best wine out, get the best food out, get people over to the house, enjoy, you know, I'll start by saying, go to church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then enjoy your wine. Go to, yeah. go to church, worship God, because that's what we're going to be doing in heaven. And then, you know, make it a day of fun and family and fellowship and friendship. And, uh, you know, make it a day that the kids say, we can't wait for the, mm. the Lord's day. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's, so that's, that's good. Type of what's to come. But if you if you say that Christ has fulfilled it all, then you you I would say theologically you have an over-realized eschatology mm. you, you've brought the ultimate fulfillment of the sabbath forward to christ's first coming when actually the ultimate fulfillment of the sabbath is in his second coming yeah that's that's another maybe to, to put a, a light kind of touch on it there's there's parts of it where he's talking about yeah your, your business is not going to suffer if you don't if you don't have uh, mm. business on the lord's day and i'm like man i I wonder if Chick-fil-A read um, Thomas Witherell and like, oh, I see what you're doing there. And then they crush for six days, even though they don't have Sundays open. Mm -hmm. The last I heard, each door for Chick-fil-A, and they probably aren't reading Thomas Witherell for this stuff, but mm -hmm. they're they're still beating sales on a store-to-store -store basis for most of the stores who are doing six days a week. So there's actually a practical application beyond kind of the theological of like, yeah, there's actually something to this rest stuff. Yeah, Withrow, he gets into it, doesn't he? He talks very he's, practical. He's a little economical. He gets kind of practical. Yeah, wood people yeah. Wood, making woodcraft stuff, and he's, he works it out, calculates it, and says, you know, you basically can't produce any more stuff. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. if you work for six days or seven days, and, and, and then just the tiredness, he talks about the toil, toil mm -hmm. after toil after toil, and he says, we will end up just being a restless society. And Look at society today. We we do not know how to rest. We yeah. do not know how to just relax for a day <clears throat> and not do things that we normally do. You know. Yeah. No, and I, I liked his his treatment of it because he's he's um, pushing scripturally, obviously, because he's pushing the holiness and the set apartness of the of the Lord's day, um, not just either Lord's morning, but Lord's day being this is this is a day devoted to the worship of our God and <clears throat> kind of generally speaking, like you said, kind of modern evangelicals either don't have a doctrine of the Sabbath and don't really know why do we go to church on Sundays? What's the point of this? Can't we go to church on Friday, Saturday mm -hmm. night? Is that, is that different than going to church on Sundays? And he makes a really good scriptural case for, no, this is, this is the way the Lord has instituted it post-resurrection. Yeah. I mean, in, in Sydney, where I studied at more college, they had a very low view of the Sabbath. They believed Christ had fulfilled it ultimately completely and so yeah they would talk about church on a saturday night they mm -hmm. have a service on a saturday night on a friday now i've got no problem with church being every day the anglicans you know yep. lutherans reformed churches were doing that there was midweek services in geneva with calvin yep mm -hmm. obviously i've got no problem with that but it just ended up bizarre people would like decide which service they want to go to i'll go saturday nights so we're gonna have sunday off you know yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, it becomes a it 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 produces a very pragmatic view of church. I will just go to the service that fits with my timetable rather than fitting my weekly timetable around mm. church. Yeah. You end up fitting church around what, you know, because no day is special. You, you can just go to church any day of the weekend. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, for my closing part, um, I kind of want to just, read a really cool section I, I found uh, the end of the forward by Sinclair Ferguson in the book. Um, I thought it was a really good uh, way to kind of wrap this up. Uh, he says, they might be increasingly shaped to the image of our Lord Jesus. For after all, the church to which the Savior belonged to was elder led, the family into which he was born was a covenant family, and the rhythm of his whole life was one of work and rest. Yeah, that's a good it's a good uh, little summary from from the from the man, the Sinclair Ferguson. That's that's some good stuff. I think that really captures it well, Nick, doesn't it? And people who I sh showed a preview of the forward to, interestingly, they all pulled out that very quote. Huh. That you just thing they all went oh. to and said that that just <laughs> yeah. right there. Yeah, that, that Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and in his life on earth, you know he actually was a part of these three aspects of yeah. being a part of the church. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on. I don't know if there's anything that, that we missed that 
you want to kind of pull off in the book, your editing work. And um, yeah, if, if you have any kind of parting thoughts on what you hope people get from this book after they read it, uh, what are you hoping, not just that they do, but they, they come away with after reading this book? Well, I said at the end of, um, I said in my introduction <clears throat> that um, if you pick up Withrow to read it, he will make you think and he will challenge you. But if at the end of the day, uh, you remain unconvinced of his arguments, at least he will have produced more thoughtful believers. Uh -huh. So even if you're listening to this podcast, you think, I don't, I'm not going to agree with that. Well, why not read it? Why not see why you disagree with it? And mm -hmm. it'll make you a better Anglican or a better Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, because um, uh, I think even if you don't end up where Withrow is at, uh, it's good to think about these things and be, um, be sharpened in our understanding yeah. of them. So mm -hmm. my, my hope and prayer is that it's not just read by ministers, it's read by laity and church members in the pew and uh, because it's accessible for yeah. them um, and that if it, by the end you're not um, uh, convinced or converted uh, that's completely fine because you know one day we're going to get to heaven and uh, in heaven it will all be sorted out and we'll all be uh, finally perfect Presbyterians. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping you'd end that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so be, it'll, yeah. all work, it'll all work out fine in the end if you're not right. my, you will be then yeah 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 no that's that's good yeah we we, we say a lot of this in jest but there, yeah there's um yeah we'll, we'll, we'll be a community of believers and um yeah. but it's always good to be thinking about this stuff and sharpening our tools sharpening our minds why do we believe what we believe where do these institutions come from <clears throat> so and i think this book will, will go a long way in in helping us think about that stuff but thanks for thanks for coming on where, where can people find you to see your work and to follow you and see what you're up to um well, they they can't find me i live in <laughs> hiding um but uh i just my i suppose my faculty page at the yeah. westminster theological seminary i um yeah i don't really have another way to promote <laughs> no the seminary has a page there for each faculty member yeah. so you yeah. can see what books i've contributed to their produce so yeah yeah cool well thanks for coming on it's been a pleasure well thank you peter and nick it's been a joy uh, to be on and uh, to speak with you so thank you very much absolutely yeah we will uh hopefully we'll, we'll talk to you again soon but until then yeah it's been a pleasure and we'll, we'll see you i'm sure we'll see you again okay